Sunday. Happy Sunday. Happy Wrong. Sunday. Who's his favorite He-Man character? They don't have a favorite He-Man character. And can it be Skeletal, He-Man, and I'll see Why don't we start recording? We already are recording. What? Yep. I said stop recording. Because I've already started. Oh. Say hi. Alright. Where's Elizabeth? Tell them bye. Where is Elizabeth? Uh, that hope is. Happy Valentine's Day. Bye. Happy yeah. Valentine's Day. Bye bye. Alright, go on. Happy right. Valentine's Day. Yeah. Bye bye. Okay, no, no. Do that, do that, do that, do that. Go on. Okay. Today we're going to just go on and jump right into the devotional because last week was a little long. This week is not as long as last week. Um, but I do want to go on um, and get started. Today we're talking about Herod Antipas. And um, I don't know, some things in this uh, came to light, I guess, or was brought to light to me. Um, and it's pretty interesting, and I just know Herod, most of us probably know Herod as, um, Herod, uh, but Herod Antipas is the one that had John beheaded. That is what I think of when I, th when we talk about this Herod, that is what I think about. And that is what we're going to talk about today. But I want to read what the author of this book said about Herod. And he said, as it was the case with most kings in ancient times, Herod Antipas considered the world a, gar a world a garden right for the picking. It didn't matter to him that he was not the one who planted the seeds. He was king, appointed by Augustus himself, and as king he felt entitled to every fig found on the world's weary limbs. Such was his attitude towards his brother's wife, Herodias. He did not care if she was both his sister-in-law and his niece. Never before had he seen in a woman a ruthlessness and royalty matching his own. Yes, Herodias was one of a kind. He had to have her. Then John came along saying, It is unlawful for you to have her. The prophet persisted even after Herod had him thrown into prison. It was Herodias' idea to have him beheaded. Herod thought the silver platter was a gruesome touch, but even after John's head was lifted from his shoulders, he could hear his voice. You should not have her. Strange reports about a man who, could have ca who cast out demons and healed the sick were circulating in Herod's territory of Galilee. Quickly, he dispatched one of his messengers, Find this man and bring him to me. Despite the fact that Herod had gained the object of his affections, he was haunted all the same. He may have possessed the power to snuff out life's little annoyances, but still, he looked over his shoulder for the ghost of John. And I thought that was very fitting, um, a very good description of Herod. Um, and we can see he wasn't really a good man. Um... So, to summarize what we just read, Herod was a king, and he felt entitled to everything. Anything he wanted, anything he saw, it didn't matter if it was right, wrong, it didn't matter. It was his. So, he even took this to his brother's wife, who his brother's wife was not only his sister-in-law, but his niece. He wanted her. He got her. And why? Because he was the king. So when this happened, John came and told Herod, hey, you're wrong. You cannot have Herodias as, wife, or as, Herodias as a wife. It's against the law. It's not natural. It's not right. And in turn, what happened to John? He stood up for what was right. He was trying to teach the man the truth, trying to stand up, and Herod had him beheaded. He's like, I'll show you again what the king wants, the king gets. And we know the story, um, and there's more to that story of how John got beheaded, but that's the gist of it. And basically, Herod got what he wanted. He um, Then, once he does it, the very last thing that he always like had the ghost of John thinking that was haunting him, he finds out that he's killed one of God's people. Herod kills one of God's people. And as I was doing this devotional, it kind of clicked to me. Um, I guess because I'm doing this for the teenage class and then I'm also going back over it a couple more times to do the devotional here because this devotional goes into a little bit more in depth than what I do for the teens. But when I was reading over this again, getting ready to do this today, 
something kind of clicked with me. We're on the fourth chapter. We've talked about four different people. And in every single chapter, every single group of people, we talked about the prophets, we've talked about the Jewish leaders, we've talked about Herod, and we talked about Judas. What do they all have in common? What have I said before? It's like a light bulb goes off. When they do something wrong, a light bulb goes off of, this was someone special. I've really messed up. For Judas, it was as soon as the kiss happened, this light bulb. But Jesus had told him someone's going to betray me by a kiss, someone in this room. Herod, again, he knows. He doesn't know John's one of God's people, but he knows he doesn't like John. He has John beheaded, and as soon as John's beheaded, it's like the light bulb goes off. I've killed one of God's people. I've killed somebody important. And we've seen this in every chapter. And I don't know what it is, but that's something that kind of stood out to me is as soon as the mindless act, the criminal act, whatever the betrayal is done, they get this sudden guilt. And we know Herod had guilt or he wouldn't be worried. His conscience wouldn't be saying, watch your back, right? And he feels like John is haunting him. He wouldn't feel that way um, if he had been up and up and done things right. So back to Herod. As we can see, Herod was not a good man, but he gets it honestly. His father was Herod the Great, whom had ten wives. Ten. Some he had for loyalty, some he had for solidarity, some for status. So we had wives for different things, but he had ten wives. So during these days, kings ruled together to run parts of the Roman Empire. But they did not share the same level of authority. They were all kings, but they all had different levels. The emperor was on top, so that was the one with the most power, the highest you could go as emperor. Then underneath him, you had other rulers governed locally throughout the provinces in the Roman Empire. One of the provinces was run by Herod Antipas. The particular province he was over was Jesus' home, Galilee. King Herod the Great was in power when Jesus was born, so we have the dad who has the ten wives that was not a good example. He's in power when Jesus was born. When, he, when King Herod died, when King Herod the Great died, Herod Antipas takes over. And the reason Herod takes over is because now King Herod the Great was in charge of one big section. They divided it between three sons. So they took this one section and divided it into three equal parts. And the part that Galilee was in, um, where, Jesus is, where Jesus was at this time, was now governed by Herod Antipas. Um, and so we see that that is why, or this is why, Herod plays an ultimate role in Jesus' crucifixion. Jesus is under him. He's under his rule. Herod is the king of this section that Jesus happens to be living in at that time. So we see then this is where we start to um, see the role of Herod come in. Herod Antipas was the one we talked about when we talked about Pilate. Um, this is the Herod that Pilate sent Jesus to. Pilate wanted to get rid of Jesus. Pilate did not want to make the call to have Jesus killed. So why not pass them off? Um, he didn't like Herod. You know, let's get back at you. I'm going to send you this person. I'm going to let the blood be on your hands. So now this is how we get to Herod. This is how Jesus is before Herod. Um, he's under trial with Pilate. Pilate doesn't see anything wrong. He wants his hands washed of this, so he sends him to Herod. Luke 7, verses 8 and 9 says, Now Herod, the tetrarch, heard about all that was happening, and he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of an old had risen. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought out to see him. We go down, stay in Luke, but go down to chapter 23, verse 8. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some signs done by him. So these verses tell us, that Herod had been hearing about the works of Jesus. He wanted to see Jesus himself. That happens. That comes true. But when Herod finally gets the chance to see Jesus face to face, he's hoping to see miracles. He's hoping to have something to accuse Jesus of, and Jesus refuses. Jesus does not do any miracles. 
And you're like, okay, why? Why not give Herod what he wants? Because, you know, he's the king. Herod gets what he wants, right? Jesus knew that Herod was interested in him, but out of selfish reasons. Herod wanted to see his miracles to see a show, like watching a magician perform tricks. He, Herod also wanted to see this, wanted to see this Mandy miracle so he could clear his conscience about John. You know, at the beginning we said there's that little head following John around, that little ghost behind Herod, it's not following John, the little ghost behind Herod that is haunting um, Herod because he killed John. Herod wants his conscience cleared. He wants Jesus to show these miracles. Jesus refuses. He's done to them. Well, he don't refuse. He's done to them. He doesn't give in to the request. So when this happened, Herod starts to question Jesus. He's like, all right, if you're not going to do miracles and I can't uh, accuse you of things by what I see with my own eyes, I'm going to start asking you questions. So we're going to stay in Luke. And Luke 23, 9 and 10 says, so he questioned him at some length. This is Herod questioning Jesus. But Jesus made no answer. The chief priest and the scribe stood by vehemently accusing him. And Herod with his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. We see here, what did Jesus do? He made no answer. Even though he was being accused, being mocked, he stood there and he took it off. He never gave in. He never did a miracle. He never uttered a word. Could we do that? Could we do that? Today, when we are being questioned, whether by family, by friends, by church members, by coworkers, by neighbors, by coaches, by whatever, how many of us can stand there, be accused, be mocked, and never utter a word? We stand there and take it all. I'd say very little. I don't know of anybody. Now, I might be able to stand there and take it for a little bit, maybe five, ten seconds. But this went on and on and on. And you have the chief priest and you have the scribe standing, or, yeah, the scribe standing by watching, mocking, accusing. So you've got a crowd. You've got people just taunting you. And he stood there and took it. This is what it says is, this was predicted in Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he not opened his mouth. Well, Jesus not opening his mouth. Do you think Herod took that kindly? No, it just made him more mad. So first, Jesus isn't showing the miracles. Now Jesus isn't answering them. So we're going to try again. Later on, it says, Pilate says, neither him nor Herod had found anything in Jesus' conduct deserving of death. It was important for Jesus to remain innocent of all the charges against him. It would, if it hadn't been of perfect, if he hadn't have been of perfect, then our world would have been completely different. We wouldn't have a chance to get to heaven. We would all be lost. This horrible act had to happen to someone, but that someone had to be innocent, pure, and holy. And the only person that was innocent, pure, and holy this his whole life was Jesus. We needed Jesus to go through this awful, horrible event to save us. Not to save himself, to save us. So we have a chance to get to heaven so we have the opportunity so that we have the choice it is up to us to get to heaven jesus paved the pathway so to speak he gave us the road it's up to us to take it but none of that could have happened if jesus didn't go through all of this if he wasn't mocked if he wasn't accused if he wasn't um made fun of if he wasn't beaten if he didn't have to deal with these horrible people None of this would have been possible for us. As for Herod, his adultery to Herodias led to his downfall. Eretus, the Nabatean king, and I'm sure I said that was completely wrong, whose daughter had been Herod's, Herod's wife before he became involved with Herodias, attacked his son-in-law and defeated Herod's troops. So the daddy of 
one of Herod's wives, before Herodias showed up in the picture, came, attacked Herod, defeated Herod's troops, and this is when we see Herod's whole world start to collapse. He's on the downfall. Some will say he got what was owed to him, right? He was a horrible person from the beginning. He got what was owed to him. So I want us to think about something this week. Um, this was about kings. We, we talked about two kings. We talked about King Herod tonight and obviously the ultimate King Jesus. We have King Herod who is doing the torment and doing the taunting. Um, or standing there watching it, letting it happen, who is wanting Jesus to do miracles, wanting him um, to answer questions just so he can trap them, so he can clear his own conscience. And we got the ultimate king, who is Jesus, who is pure, who's holy, who's perfect. Which king do we follow? And you might say, well, Paula, we don't have those kings today. King Herod's long gone. Um, Jesus is in heaven. We can't technically follow Jesus. We can. We read the Bible. We do his word. We um, do what we're supposed to do. We can follow him. But do we follow our heavenly king, Jesus, strive to get to heaven? Or are we following our earthly king, if you will, the Herod of today, the world? We have a choice. Are we following the world? Or are we following Jesus? Are we trying to get it right? Are we trying to be pure? Are we trying to be holy? Are we trying to be the Christian we need to be? Or are we being a Herod? Are we the one mocking? Are we the one throwing stones? Are we the ones not living right and having whatever we want when we want it and how we want it? Because, hey, it's a free world and we can do it, right? We have our freedom. Which one are we following? Hopefully, we're all striving to follow um, Jesus and trying to get to heaven. Um, so, that is what I have on Herod. Next week, we are going to talk about um, Pontius Pilate. Um, I thought we had already talked about him, but we have not. Uh, so, we will talk about Pilate next week. I hope everyone has a great week. Hopefully, you'll stay warm. I haven't looked at the weather forecast this week, but hopefully, it's a little bit warmer than it was last week. I um, hope everyone has a great week, and thank you for listening, and I'll see you next week.